you're watching this, you're probably already pretty much convinced as I am that we humans aren't the only bipedal hominid species on the earth. If not, I did my best to validate the existence of Bigfoot in part one, The Science of Sasquatch, in which I showed some of the best video proof on the web, as well as parts of some interviews of two of the key people behind the Sasquatch Genome Project. In case you didn't realise, the Sasquatch genome has been mapped and catalogued in the ZooBank database, which means it's officially a real species, named Homo sapiens cognatus. Here's a link to a thorough rundown of the findings of the project explained in layman's terms by someone a lot more qualified than myself. Basically, the study found that the three individual creatures who had their genomes fully mapped had human, mitochondrial and unknown nuclear DNA. So, just how human are they? In part two, I'm going to look into some of the documented human interaction with these bipedal hairy hominids. The nature of the interactions usually seems to depend on where each local variant can be placed on the man-ape spectrum. The more ape-like, the greater the tendency for violent encounters. This is of course a major generalisation based on eyewitness reports. But unfortunately, until Bigfoot is acknowledged in the mainstream as a real creature, circumstantial evidence is all we have. Fortunately, when you actually look into it, we have a lot of it. And when you sift through it to find the best reports, there's a lot to learn. Some tribes have multiple names for the beasts, and judging by descriptions, they often apply to different variants. Generally, they do display characteristics of what is described as a mix of the great ape and human features. Size varies drastically, from about 1 to 3 meters. But there are plenty of credible reports of creatures which sound straight out of fairy tales, like 6 meter tall mountain giants, knee high gnomes and fairies. Then there's the scary number of werewolf like creatures, which have come to be known as dogman, but I'll save that for another video. This is about the upright hairy hominids. Skeptics often remark that if the Sasquatch were real, we'd be finding their bones. Perhaps we have been for years, and I've been mislabeled as Homo erectus and Homo neanderthalus. And if viable DNA was found and tested, it would have been deemed contaminated, as has happened when Sasquatch DNA was tested prior to the Sasquatch Genome Project. Now that I've muddied the water, let's have a look at some of the fairly recent documented human interaction with the Olmas or Olmasti, the Bigfoot variant native to the Caucasus Mountains area in Central Asia. Perhaps the most interesting story of them all, Zana from Russia, an Alma. Remember I told you that the Almas were also man-sized, 5 to 7 feet tall, 300 600 pounds, and they're dominant in Russia and the Orient? This is Alma, the living Neanderthal. This is one of them right here. This is, Zana is an Alma, was an Alma. Now, understand this. In the Orient, the tradition when one of these things is captured, for whatever reason, was to kill it immediately. Desiccate its body and sell its body parts for medicine, principally aphrodisiacs. That's the Oriental tradition. In the Russian area, though, when they would be captured, male or female, they would be used as slaves. Physical slaves held spirits broken in these uh, primitive villages where they would be, and they would be used to carry wood, fetch water, uh, do the haying, all the heavy work nobody really wants to do, make the slave do it. And so that became their fate. And for females, another aspect of it was they had to become the sex slaves of the men of the area. And that was one of the other great advantages to having a female. And so, this is the fate that befell Zanna in about 1850. She was captured as an adult in 1850. We do not know how old she was, but she was an adult. 
She was taken to the village of Tekina where they kept her in a hole for about three years until her spirit was broken enough to let her wander around. She was dependent on them for food and then they began to train her to fetch wood, fetch water, do the things that she had to do. And she became like the village pet for 40 years. She died in 1890. Now, how do we know this? Because in the Orient and Russia, they don't have the same tradition that we have. They're very old countries. They've been living with this for a very long time, for centuries. They know they're real. They send research out, researchers out taking information about it. They send teams out trying to find them, or they used to when Russia had money. They don't now. But this was done in the mid-1970s. Excuse me, I'm sorry, mid-1960s. This research was done in the mid-60s. So, in the mid-1960s, this is an area of Kazakhstan where she lived, where people live very long lives. You know those p places in the world where people live up around 120 years old? So they had over 100 people above the age of 80 that had known her quite well in their youth. There were 10 still alive who had attended her funeral. So they were able to get tremendous corroborative evidence, corroborative testimony about her, her lifestyle, and everything about her from all these different people so we have an amazing view of what she was like and what her life was like. Uh, again, a lot of which I go over in, in the book. But the main thing is that she never learned to speak, but she learned the language. They could talk to her and she'd know what they meant. And while there, she gave birth eight times to hybrids with men of the village. Eight times. Killed the first four accidentally because her kind apparently washes the newborn off immediately. She would take it to the freezing glacial river that ran through the village and because they had so much human in them, it would kill them. So the last four, the village women took them from her at birth and raised them on their own because they looked so human and every pair of hands was very valuable in one of those primitive villages like that. And so they raised them up and they became Russian citizens. Married, had children, her great-grandchildren are alive in Russia to this day. I know, it's an amazing story. Now, what do people say about her children? Well, the, everybody said that they were indeed taller than most, bigger than most, ro a little more robust than most, but not giants, not superhumans, just strong, you know, big and strong people. Darker skinned than most, but not, not truly Negroid. Hair like, you know, everybody, but not covered in hair like she was. Average intelligence, not, not wizards, not stupid. Ugly enough to make a freight train take a dirt road. <laughs> Unfortunately for them. But they could speak, that's the key, they could all speak. They had very high-pitched voices, but they could speak, which allowed them to integrate into the community as humans, even though they were clearly not quite humans. So the researchers were real excited to get all this information. It's like, wow. And they, and they knew where she was buried. She was buried in the village cemetery. Unfortunately, this is a Muslim area. They don't mark gravestones there. So they knew she was in the village cemetery, which had existed for centuries, and, and they couldn't say just where because of the 10 people that were alive, they all had different memories of where it had been. Who knew that 70, 80 years later, somebody was gonna care? So they couldn't decide, they couldn't, and they would've had to bulldoze the whole thing. The village wouldn't let them do that. So somebody says, well, guess what? Her youngest son, Kvit, died in 1954, only 10 years prior to this study. So they said, we know where he is, we'll let you dig him up. So boy, they dug him up. Her youngest son, Kvit. Now, before we look at his skull, I want to say again, remember, Neanderthals had bigger brains than we did, and they carry them, we do rather than they carry them in a bun in the back of their head called the occipital bun. All right, let's take a look at Kvit's Fifth skull. Here you go, right here. Notice, if you will, that's a remnant of an occipital bun right there. Notice how much of a forehead he doesn't have. Look at the size of these brow ridges. Look at that eye socket. Is it starting to look familiar? Look at the size of that nasal passage. Look at the size of these teeth. Look at the size of that jawbone. Look at the size of the cheekbone. But look at that chin. Allows him to speak. This is an ugly dude, kids. This is a Neanderthal, basically. This is a guy you do not want to meet in a dark alley. Now, what, of course, anthropologists say is that he is an extreme variation on the human norm, an extreme, <laughs> real extreme variation on the human norm. But that's how they explain it. 
Okay, I ask you to take my word for it. Hominoids are real. That's pretty disturbing, but that's just the story, right? Sure, the sun skull does have some Neanderthal-like traits, but we need more evidence. And it turns out we have it. This video shows a guy from the Sichuan province of China. The dude's mother had claimed she was kidnapped by a Yiren, the Chinese wild man who raped her repeatedly before she escaped back to her village. Nine months later she gave birth to this strange boy who grew abnormally large. Although he was never able to speak, he did gain a mild understanding of what people said to him. He lived to be 33 years old, and because he was kept hidden in a small village, not much was known about him. Skeptics claim that he was born with a neurodevelopmental disorder called microcephaly, which causes abnormal head growth, poor brain function, and a shorter life expectancy. They say that the mother was ashamed of having a retarded baby, and made up the story about being raped by a Bigfoot. This is crazy to me on so many levels. Surely the easy option would be to admit your child is simply retarded rather than a half-human hybrid, a result of rape by a mythical beast. And microcephaly doesn't come close to explaining the Bigfoot-like traits such as robust bone structure, long arms and lack of neck, as well as the sloping forehead and brow ridge. Amazingly enough, this poor kid may he rest in peace isn't a one-off. Meet Basu from the Valley of Dades near the town of Skora in Morocco. He sleeps in the trees, wears no clothes, subsists on dates, berries and insects, uses no tools and only speaks in grunts. Sounds familiar right? He's been touted as half human half ape but it seems much more likely to me that he's the result of interbreeding between humans and North Africa's Bigfoot alternative. These two share remarkably similar bone structure and it does indeed seem halfway between that of Sasquatch and human. A YouTuber named Thinkathunker has analysed a large number of Bigfoot videos and determined a consistent ratio of arm to leg length that is around halfway between humans and great apes. According to two out of three Americans, this is a man in a monkey suit. A female monkey suit. We'll call him Patty. And here's the man who claims he was the one wearing that very female monkey suit. We'll call him Bob. And while I wouldn't call Bob a liar, his own body ratios are about two, so stick around. This might just be a game changer. <laughs> hey, this thing of ugger. Now, I'm not willing to say Patty here is a Bigfoot, but I am willing to say she's a non-human, ratio-wise. I'll show you what I mean. You, me, all of us humans have at least one thing in common. Our legs are longer than our arms. While chimps, apes, and most other primates, they're the exact opposite. So where does Patty fit in? To explore this further, first I needed to know if there was a normal range for human body ratios. Or does it vary from person to person? So, to help illustrate human diversity at extreme levels, we have martial arts and movie superstar Bruce Lee and NBA legend, martial artist and movie star as well, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. And I'm thinking, there's no way these guys share any ratios. And lo and behold, after measuring them, I found that their arms were exactly 20% shorter than their legs. Both of them. So what about Bob? He should match up the same, shouldn't he? And he does. Right on the money, Bob's arms are 20% shorter than his legs, just like the rest of us. The next really big question was, what about Patty Bob here? Because now, even if her arm to leg ratio is different by even a little, that whole man in a monkey suit theory, 
that thing's gonna start to crumble. And after measuring Patty, I found that her ratios, they're not off by just a little. They're out of the ballpark off. Patty's arms are astonishingly only 5% shorter than her legs. And that puts Patty smack dab Let's check out the ratios on these guys. Unfortunately, the urine boy video is short and really bad quality, so there isn't a whole lot to use. In this still, which was the best I could find, his arms were shortened by perspective. So I'm using another shot in which his whole arm is at the same depth of field as his head. So I have to match the head size um, as best as I can. Obviously, it's not going to be perfect. And now I have a usable arm. Next step, cut out the forearm separately and rotate at the elbow joint to straighten it out and it's ready for measurements. So the urine boy's arms are 11.6% shorter than his legs and this is arms are 13.4% shorter than his legs which makes them about halfway between a uh, human and the sasquatches that Thinker Thunker has measured. So in my humble opinion we have fairly strong evidence that at least some of these Bigfoot type creatures can produce viable offspring with humans From what I can tell, the DNA was collected from the most benign variety, which is loosely termed a Type 1 Bigfoot or the Paddy type. They seem to be the most curious type, which suggests they're probably the most intelligent. There are numerous cases of ongoing interactions with Type 1s. I think the intent depends on the nature of the individuals or the troop that they're from. They've been known to abduct children, which some native tribes played up to keep their young in check. The perpetrators are often females, quite possibly who have lost their own young. There are cases of family groups of Sasquatch letting their children play with human kids. They seem to be fascinated with children. But often it's for more nefarious purposes. Among some Native American tribes, their Bigfoot variants are known to be cannibals, which is interesting, as it infers that the Sasquatch are actually a type of people. <laughs>